This is an interview with Rick Greenberg on July 12, 2008 at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia about his role in the smallpox eradication project. And the interviewer is Carrie White. With this interview, we are hoping to capture for future generations the memories of participants and their families involved in eradicating smallpox. This is an incredibly important and historic achievement and we want, you, we want to hear about your experience. I have some questions to guide you, but please feel free to recount any special stories and anecdotes that you have about the events that were, took place and the people that you worked with. And the legal agreement you just signed says that you are donating the oral history to the U.S. federal government and it will be put on the public domain. So for the record, could you please state your full name and that you know you're being recorded? Yeah, I'm Richard Neil Greenberg and I know I'm being recorded. Thank you, Rick. So. First of all, we just wanted to get a little bit of background on your childhood and the type of education you had before you set out to do the Eradication Smallpox Program in India. I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I went to Cornell University. I went to Tufts University School of Medicine and took two years of residency program in medicine and then went to the Center for Disease Control where I was stationed in Louisiana uh, actually in the city of New Orleans and I started uh, after my training uh, one month training at CDC I started in August in uh, New Orleans and really had never traveled to any developing area just basically uh, Europe Canada and the United States uh, in uh, December I was asked to volunteer okay. to consider going to India to work in the WHO smallpox eradication program. That was December of 1974. So should I, should I? Well, I just wanted to ask you what your responsibilities were when you were sent over there in 74 and the province that you were, you were telling me a little bit about the province that you were working in? Yeah, well, the responsibility was basically to f find and contain uh, all the outbreaks of smallpox in the area that I was assigned, which was a, a western uh, district uh, just bordering on Uttar Pradesh near the city of uh, Varnasi, but I was in Bihar. Okay. And um, I was the last district before you entered Uttar Pradesh, and I was stationed there for about three months. Okay. So during your time, it, you were in the north, what was your experience like with um, the local people and how you interacted with them while you were trying to work well, on the project? I'd, I'd like to kind of tell you from the very get-go what happened. Okay. Uh, I'm, I was pretty uh, unexperienced and hadn't a clue uh, what uh, Asia and the subcontinent were all about. In fact, um, I had stopped uh, on my way to India uh, and the assignment to visit relatives in uh, Israel and then landed a little early, early in the morning of the day I was supposed, of, of the evening I was supposed to be in New Delhi in Bombay and I read my travel books and I figured it'd be great to go see the gates of India uh, and the, the, the um, mystical city of Bombay and I arrived about, uh, about daybreak at the Bombay airport, which was a nice airport, and I checked my luggage, and then I asked an information person uh, how I could get to the gates of India, if I could just take the subway. And I got a very strange look from this individual, and he said, uh, you're better off taking a taxi. But I wanted to just experience the whole trip, and I uh, asked where the station was. They told me I had to walk out and all of a sudden uh, I was confronted with what appeared to be a sea of individuals a either asking for uh, what they call bakshis or tips uh, or if I wanted a taxi ride. Um, it, I, I was lost uh, so I quickly maneuvered through this crowd of people uh, down a, a relatively dirty road and then I entered the subway station and I realized, I think for the first time, I was somewhere else because all the signs were not in English. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I 
handed some money to get in, and I, I, the, the subway uh, had a stairway that would take you down to many, many uh, tracks, just like the old-fashioned train stations, which had many trains at, 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 at many uh, different tracks. Every sign was in Hindi. I, I, there were many people without arms and legs on the stairs asking for um, donations. And the sea of people pushed me down the, the stairs, down into the subway station. I just kept moving uh, just, just because everybody else was moving. Some people were dressed with ties and jackets, and some people were just, seemed to me, just dressed with sheets on. Um, the, the cars were teeming with people. They were on top. They were on the side. Uh, I, I yelled out, oh, God. Oh, Jesus, help me. And out of the roar, I heard a sound that said, over here. And I said, who? And I heard, over here. And off into one little area by um, a subway train was a Westerner who had heard me scream, oh, God. And he he, he comforted me right away, and he said, you know, I know just what's happening to you. And I went through it. And when I went through it, there was someone to help me. And he said, I have the morning. I'm going to help you. And my first dose of culture shock was treated with uh, this, uh, by this wonderful individual who basically uh, helped me work my way through this, uh, the beginning of this adjustment. And we spent the morning uh, looking at the museums in the city of Bombay. And then in the afternoon, uh, I'd met some people, and it, life was getting a little easier. And I saw what I wanted to see, and then I hopped a plane to New Delhi, uh, just amazed at what I had gone through in that one day of, of learning what culture shock was. If I look down, I have some notes here of these short little stories. Um, when we arrived uh, uh, in New Delhi the next day, we, we went to the WHO headquarter, headquarters and Dr. Fagey and, and um, his staff gave us instructions, very clear instructions on what we were to do and what smallpox would look like. And there was a group of us from America that met over there, about five or six individuals. And um, so we went through the training and then we were shipped out by plane. Um, uh, the, gr the group was divided into those people that went to UP, Uttar Pradesh, and the group that went to Bihar. And I can remember uh, as the plane flew over, uh, I believe it was Patna. Uh, it was clouded in and the plane couldn't land. So then it went to Lucknow to land and then came back to Patna to land. And, and I, was, I was a little concerned about all this, but at that time that was how they flew over in India. There, they, there were times you couldn't land because of poor visibility. And when we got to uh, Patna, uh, the local um, administrators again trained us again and took us out on our first field trip to see the, a, a containment, the, our first case of smallpox. And we went to a park and in, the, and in the park was a tent and in the tent was an old man and there were three or four of us there that were going to work in Bihar at that time. And he showed us his smallpox. And it turned out what he was showing us was syphilis. And kind of didn't know how to take that, except figured that we better be thinking for ourselves during this period of time and not taking other people's words for it. We didn't say anything to our hosts, but uh, it did raise um, some eyebrows to know that here he'd been trained to see smallpox, and the first real case in the field was syphilis. Then um, got in a jeep and uh, drove to my assignment, which was several hours away uh, in land that I, I, that, that I was taking in for the first time and all the different cultural things that I was seeing that I really shouldn't, don't have, shouldn't necessarily go into, but it was just different. Very rural, very agricultural. Uh, and the roads were very scary. When I arrived, um, I, should, I should mention that um, 
I was warned that there may not be the, the kind of resources you'd expect, such as a grocery store, uh, and that you better stock up on things before you get to your assignment. So actually in Delhi, uh, we, went, we did go to the American Embassy and I took an empty suitcase. And I went to their uh, commissary and basically clean, uh, cleared out uh, their, their little store of all the tuna fish and all the fruit cocktail and anything else in a can that I thought I could use for the next three months, toilet paper. And people thought it was a little strange that I came in there with an empty suitcase, but I can guarantee you that when I left, it was full. And it did make a, a huge difference in my survival uh, because where I was, there was no such thing as a restaurant. There was no such thing as a hotel. In fact, if you wanted chicken for dinner, the chicken had to be per the live chicken had to be purchased, and the cook that uh, you asked to prepare it would actually kill it, uh, take the feathers out, and then cook it. You'd actually have fresh chicken. Refrigeration was a luxury. Um, so, uh, you know, we had to scrounge around to find a place to stay. I actually found a a very nice little rest home with three uh, rooms and I stayed there and it had a, a, a what they call a chokidar and a cook who uh, helped take care of me during my assignment. So I, I, I survival was number one and I and with my suitcase and, and with this little um, three bedroom relic from I guess when the British were there um, I survived uh, and, was, and was able to focus on my job. And then the work began. And I'm looking down here to see what the second thing is I wanted to talk about. I, when I got there, um, I, just, I tried to, to understand the culture and tried to understand the people and tried to understand myself. And I guess I wasn't doing a very good job because I got a letter from Dr. Fagey telling me that if I don't do a better job, he, he may send me home. And shortly after that, um, an experienced uh, smallpox eradication uh, worker named Steve Jones uh, arrived, and God bless Steve Jones because uh, he changed my life. He explained to me how to do the job right, um, and for a couple of days there, I felt like I had a real brother. And uh, he reiterated uh, what Dr. Fagey had told me, but he showed me how to put it into action. And I think from that moment on, I. I made a 180 degree turn and was able to find the, the, uh, re the remaining uh, spots of smallpox. Where I was, most of the cases had been uh, eliminated, eradicated. Um, there were, I think I saw about 35 cases of smallpox and I saw the last cases in my district. Uh, so it was a lot of searching, uh, but we did find all of them. The, um, the things that Dr. Jones taught me were to be tough, uh, follow my instinct, make sure I did everything fully, no shortcuts, and if, and if the people asked me if I wanted to go to the left to, to inspect the houses on the left in a village, I go right. If they didn't want me to go somewhere, I went there. Um, I would come back to the villages three or four hours after I had set up containment to find uh, what was going on. And when the villagers realized that I was going to continue to go and come and go and come and not announce myself, uh, and plus we were paying them, uh, and those that didn't do their job lost their job, we, we set up excellent containment. There was an outbreak in one village where we set up containment very well, very strict, came back, surprised them, uh, told them that if I didn't come back, my scouts would be back because I hired people to do the same thing. And then, and then one day uh, I arrived at this village. Actually, uh, Dr. Millar was with me, and uh, the containment was excellent. But the village leader called me over, and he said, we're very uh, proud of, <clears throat> of, of the containment and everything you did, and we owe you more credit than you know. And the, I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, well, the guard in front of the village uh, met an individual who was a scout for a decoit party, which are thieves. And they would come into these villages 
and wreck the villages and rob the people. But the scout decided that his group shouldn't uh, rob this village because they'd all have to be vaccinated and show their vaccination scars. So they went to the next village. And what the village leader told me was, if you go down the road five kilometers, you might not come back. Those people are very angry. We're very happy. So I actually uh, ran into this kind of activity. In fact, there was a story going around our area where another band of Dacoits had, they stopped these, tr uh, these Tata trucks that go up and down the highway. And one truck they stopped was full of uh, army sharpshooters who, had, who were returning from a competition. And uh, everybody learned that that particular band of Dacoits didn't get out of the, didn't make it, they all were shot. They robbed the wrong truck. So we, this, this part of Bihar was uh, loaded with political instability. Um, there was a, a big um, metal mine that was, that was operating there, I think a tin mine, that was blown up uh, as a protest uh, while I was there. So um, it, was, it was an interesting time. Um, every Sunday while I was there, a, a, a fellow would drive up in a Jeep. Now it was very unusual for someone to just drive up in a Jeep because gas was hard to get. And most Jeeps that were there were WHO Jeeps. So if someone had a private Jeep, that was, that was unusual. That was um, something equivalent to a being a movie star in that part of the, the world. I didn't want to ask him how he could afford not only the Jeep, <laughs> but the gasoline. But he would come with his son, and we'd sit down, and we'd have breakfast, and we'd sit and talk. And he told me he wanted his son uh, to get a, a Western education and this would be a good introduction to what an American was like. I, I want to mention at that time I had hair down to my shoulders and I was known as the local hippie. So uh, anyway, I didn't, I didn't uh, pursue this too much, but at the end, when I was ready to leave, I laid out everything that I thought I wanted to leave in India and that was just about everything. The only thing I took with me were uh, just a change of clothes and a camera, the little camera that I took, and I left everything else there. I figured they needed it more than me and they could enjoy it more than me. So I left them a, a Zenith uh, Trans Oceanic Radio, uh, Tony Lima leather cowboy boots, sleeping bags, tents, uh, just about everything I had I left there. And I had um, a lot of uh, the, the workers come to say goodbye, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. But he shows up, and he walks into my room, and he says, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I want this. And I said, wait a minute. Take one thing, and let me give the rest to the others. He said, no. He said, I want all of these. I want your radio. I want your cowboy boots. I want your sleeping bag. I want your jacket, just like that. And then he said, maybe you don't get it. Maybe you don't know who I am. Do you remember the time you went to the bank with all that money that was in? We, we'd go to the bank about once a month to deposit our WHO money because we were paying the, um, the, the workers to help us. And I had somewhere between 200 and 300 volunteers. They weren't volunteers. They were paid workers. They're getting two to five rupees a day. So I had a payroll. And I'd have to get that money from uh, Putna and then put it in the bank. I never, no one ever got close to me, and I'm walking with all this money uh, under my jacket. He said, remember the times that you were on the road? And there were logs blocking your Jeep, and you'd get out and take the logs and remove them from the road. Did you ever get bothered by anybody here? You saw no crime. I said, you're right. He said, well, I'm the reason for that. I put a bounty on anybody who would hurt you. And he said, um, and, and I had someone following you the whole time here to make sure that nothing happened to you. you didn't, he said, you didn't realize the, 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 the tension in this area and being a Westerner, um, how you stood out. We wanted to eradicate smallpox and we wanted you to succeed. And this was my contribution to, uh, to make sure that you were 
are going to be okay. I said, take it all. I was so appreciative of being able to go home. There was a day I was homesick and I wanted to get this letter off and I went to the post office and the, it, it was almost like going to a judge. You look up in a big um, platform and there was the person up there and I said to him, I, I, I said, please be sure I have all the stamps necessary to send my letter home. And, and the whole front of the envelope was covered with stamps. Well, when I checked out in Delhi, um, the operations officer comes running up to me and he says, oh, you're Rick Greenberg, are you? He said, everybody knows about you. Everybody knows everything you've been doing. Your letters are great. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, he said well, don't, I said, you know, every letter you mailed had a return address on it, WHO New Delhi. And none of the letters you mailed had the proper postage. So where I was, not even the postmaster knew what kind of postage was needed to send an international letter. And I had to pay the operations officer a small amount of money so that, he could, so that he could get paid back for having mailed my letters off. So it, give, it, it, it gives you um, a little feel for the remoteness. In fact, there were no telephones. Um, I saw an, an operating telegraph. Uh, Unbelievable. I, I, I went to a, uh, where supposedly there was a phone. The phone was out of order. And there was a man sitting on the bench in front of the, of the room, just like an old Western where you go in and you see the, you see the, the, uh, the hero walking in wanting to send a telegraph. Well, there it was, right in front of me. And, and a big, big um, telegraph key. I mean, maybe three times the size of what you picture what they look like. And he's just going like this. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the um, reports either were in person when, when we reported to Putna every month and in person, took the trip up there, or we sent people by bus uh, or train to get a message that we needed uh, supplies. Um, it was um, very remote, uh, a little bit like uh, the movie Lawrence of Arabia where you're just out in the middle of nowhere and if you don't make the communication, it won't get through. Um, it was kind of fun to figure out how to survive in that environment, but it was also very taxing. Um, at the end of my stay, a very, there was a very special moment. Um, I had, um, I think, about four or five Jeeps, two or three motorcycles, and about 300, two to 300 people on payroll. And they all felt grateful to, uh, or had a good feeling for eradicating smallpox. You could sense the spirit. And I, and I, said, um, I said to them, uh, what can I do for you? And they said, we want a little uh, piece of paper that says that we did smallpox eradication in Rotas, my district. So it was surprising what, what you could dig up in the, in, in the little villages. And there was a printer, so we printed out uh, a little wallet size card that said blank worked as a small in the smallpox eradication program, and I signed it. And I didn't think that many people would show up, but about 300 people came that day for their their card, and it rained like crazy that day. And we were going to have a picture. So everybody got their card, and I thought, well, no one's going to come back the next day for the picture because we couldn't take the picture that day because of the rain. And I wake up the next day, and they say, come on, come on, time for the picture. They had a cameraman out there, and he was going to take this uh, fish-eyed picture, you know, and it rotates from one end to the other. I had my little camera. I look out there, there must have been 200 people on the lawn. The Jeeps lined up, the motorcycles lined up, and I'm, I, I'm in awe. They remained overnight. Somehow they found a place to stay because these were, these were people from all over the district. They weren't local. They, were, they came uh, 50, 100 kilometers away. And I asked somebody, I said, how in the world did you guys uh, get through the night. 
and they said, well, everybody opened up. We, we, stayed, we stayed in private homes, we stayed in school gymnasiums. Every, every possible person in the area just opened up for us and everybody had a place to stay. And I, 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 I cannot fathom how um, this all took place, but it said a lot for the program that not only were, um, were we over there getting something out of this and, and helping, but these individuals, these, these people right there who live there, also were getting something out of it, more than the money. They were, they were getting the self-esteem and pride um, that, that went along with the program, and I'll, I'll cherish that, uh, that day. With, and that picture hangs in my house today, the one that I took in color, a little out of focus, but there they all are, and um, so I have that. Um, on my way out through Putna, I had the opportunity to address um, uh, in the Bihar uh, state government the fact that for the first time my district, Rotas, was free of smallpox and that was another honor. When they asked me about the number of cases, I said there were no more cases. So I actually had a chance to stand up in a, in a regional uh, government session in Bihar and make that pronouncement and I'll, I won't forget that either. Um, on the way out of India, I met up with one of uh, another EIS officer. His, his name was his name is uh, Jim Vizi, and he had been in Delhi before me, and actually been in the hospital with kidney stones. And um, Jim and I both wanted to see Nepal before we left. So when the others kind of took off, we went to Nepal, and when we got uh, to Kathmandu, he was passing another kidney stone. So we called the, 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 the hotel. This, now we were at a hotel, we really, you know, a hotel, my gosh, we're, we actually are at a hotel. And um, uh, we're back to some semblance of normalcy. Um, the house doctor arrived and um, I asked him for a syringe of uh, morphine. And he, he treated Jim with painkiller, gave me a syringe with morphine. And so everywhere I went uh, that day on the airplane to uh, look uh, as tourists to look at Mount Everest, I'm carrying um, a syringe of, of uh, morphine. I think it's morphine. I don't know, some, <laughs> some uh, narcotic um, in my pocket. So I felt, you know, what, what's going to happen if they stop me and they, they search me and they find a syringe full of a drug? But uh, Jim survived and made it home, and I never had to use that uh, syringe. Uh, just one little um, final uh, mention. On the plane over to India, I met a chief resident in ophthalmology from New York University School of, uh, School of Medicine. And he told, talked to me a little bit about, well, he's going to India. And this plane was landing in Bombay. One day, uh, when we were doing our surveillance and searching in uh, Bihar, where I was, um, I was at a market. And I noticed um, they were carrying people off to a tent. So I walked up to the tent, because they said there's some doctor up there. And I wanted to see if there was smallpox. He was there. There were flies, but there were uh, people on litters, people whose eyes were solid uh, gray, and they obviously couldn't see. They had severe cataracts. And he was there every five or 10 minutes taking out a cataract. And uh, he was operating by flashlight. And I looked at him, and I said, I said, hello. And he looked at me, and he said, this is what I do on my vacation time to pay back uh, for, allow for my family allowing me to uh, get this education in New York. I come back, this is where I live. People, wouldn't, people don't have a, a clue how, I, how we grew up and how the, the conditions that we lived in. 
and I'm just doing uh, what I think is right. But please don't let anybody know. So if, I guess it's okay now, uh, some many decades later. Uh, this wonderful little deed this doctor was doing to go back to Bihar and to voluntarily take out uh, cataracts. Um, and, he, and, he, and he worked uh, very hard under the most primitive of conditions to get this job done. So, um, you know, I, I need to thank uh, the CDC for letting me be an EIS officer and uh, whoever um, asked me to go to India, uh, I, can, I certainly can say it changed my life and I, I probably have twice as many stories that I'm forgetting at the moment or don't want to tell. And, uh, but uh, it was an eye-opening experience, and I'm sure you're getting that from all the people giving these oral histories. So thank you. I'm speechless, Dr. Greenberg. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us.